All right, if you would be seated, please get out your Bibles and open up to Colossians chapter 1. Are we audible on the wireless at this point? All right, so um, I want to share a quick letter with you before, while everyone is uh, finding their seat. This letter is dated January 12, 2020, and it's uh, addressed to, to me. It says, Dear Pastor Ross, it says, We are writing uh, to you from Grace Bible Church, a small mid-ex assembly in Edina, Minnesota, a suburb of Minneapolis. We lost our founder and Bible teacher last summer when he and his wife moved to Texas to be near children and grandchildren who needed their help. Having been unable to replace him, we have been using video teachings by your ministry and a few others to keep our group together on Sunday morning studying and growing. We are enclosing a contribution for your ministry with great gratitude for your messages. They are helping us continue to be edified in the gospel of the grace of God given to Paul for the body of Christ. We are so thankful for you for sharing them online uh, so that we and others can freely access good teaching, which is difficult to find. There are a few teachers of God's, uh, of God's message today who are willing and able to lead a small assembly of grace believers scattered around the country. So access to good teaching is vital. And so this is from uh, uh, Marianne, Marianne and Cindy and uh, Rosalie Miller, and they're writing to us from uh, Minnesota. i just share that with you. Again, the ministry impacts in ways that we don't realize. And so when, people, when we get things like that, we praise the Lord for it and are grateful to have that type of a, an impact. This morning I want to get right into the study, and we're going to be in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 again. And I want to talk to you about a part two on some issues about being filled with the knowledge of His will. As I look around the congregation this morning, I see obviously a lot of new people. By the way, Sister Boone, it's good to see you. I'm praying for you. I hope all, I'm glad to see you this morning. Um, we have a lot of new people, a lot of new faces and so forth, uh, not only uh, from the standpoint of new today for the first time, but people who are near, new who have never heard me talk about the issue of knowing and doing the will of God and so forth. And uh, I want to do that this morning from the Scriptures with some new wrinkles, okay? If you've heard me talk about this before, it's not going to be exactly the same as what I've said in the past. And there'll be some things that are similar, but I have some other further thoughts on some issues that I want to bring to your attention and hopefully draw out from the Scriptures. Look with me at Colossians 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Lord, thanks again for this time we can spend together in Your Word this morning. We pray that we would be edified and built up in the faith for having done so. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> So last week we began breaking down Paul's prayer for the Colossians there in uh, verses 9 through 12. And we started really digging into the content of that. And in doing so, we looked at the last half of verse 9 there where it says, okay, and desire that he might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And I spent a lot of time last Sunday breaking that down and explaining what Paul is driving at in that statement, okay? It's not my intention this morning to redo all of that stuff. It's available for you, as we just heard, for free online if you want to check it out. But Paul is praying that the Colossians, his, the cause under which he's praying, his desire for them is that they might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Simply stated, Paul's prayer is that through wisdom and spiritual understanding, the Colossians will be filled, would be filled to capacity with the knowledge of what God is doing. And we talked about that and what all the words mean and all that stuff last Sunday. Hold your hand there and quickly go to chapter 4. Go to chapter 4, Colossians, quick. And look with me at verse 12. <clears throat> Epaphras, who we encounter also in chapter 1, has similar prayers for the Colossians. Colossians chapter 4, look at verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of, Jesus, of, of Christ, excuse me, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of who? So it's interesting. When the book of Colossians opens... There's a prayer, a uh, Holy Spirit-inspired prayer of the Apostle Paul, where he's praying that they might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding in chapter 1. Then at the end of the book, in chapter 3, or excuse me, chapter 4, we read about Epaphras, 
who is also laboring fervently for the Colossians in prayer, that they may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Okay, Folks, God's will is not something that we are charged with going out and discerning by reading the circumstances of our lives. Rather, it's something that the believer has the capacity to be filled with, as well as the ability to stand perfect and complete in, based upon a sound understanding of the word rightly divided. Most people, when they think about the will of God, they think it's this nebulous thing that's out here somewhere that they have to go sort of grope around in the dark and hopefully one day try and what? Find, right? But that's not how the Bible talks about the will of God. Paul talks about the will of God as something that we're supposed to be filled with the knowledge of, and Epaphras prays that we'd be able to stand perfect and complete in it, right? So the will of God is something is not something we're responsible to go find. The will of God is something that we're responsible to know and stand in because we know what His will is, because His will is set for us in the Scriptures. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 1 quickly. Come over to Ephesians chapter 1. We saw and ended last Sunday by looking at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9 where Paul tells the Ephesians that God has made known and revealed the mystery of His what? Of His will. There is no part, there's no piece of the will of God that He has held back on. He has made known and fully disclosed even the mystery of His will. Ephesians 1 verse 9, "...having made known unto us..." That's past tense. Okay. Now think about it. If you're responsible to know it, If you're responsible to stand perfect and complete in it, then is it something that is knowable? Yes, it's something that is knowable. It's something that is out there for you and I to know and to realize and to understand. Verse 9, "...having made known unto us," past tense, "...the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed..." Where? In Himself. So there is no peace of the will of God that God has not made known and disclosed according to His good pleasure, according to that verse. God says, through the pen of the Apostle Paul here, God says that He has revealed His will to mankind. Not only His will, but even the mystery of His will. Therefore, God's will is not something that I am charged with discerning by reading the tea leaves in my life. Okay, I go out here and I, oh, well, this is happening and that's happening. That must mean this. Or that's all going on over there, and this has happened with so and so, and brother so and so had that happen to them, so that must mean I should do this. Okay? That's the way the majority of professing Christendom thinks about the will of God, right? That it's this nebulous thing that they have to go discern in their life, but that's not how God talks about it in His Word. God talks about it in His Word as something that is knowable, number one, that's been disclosed, number two, and that He has made known the mystery of it according to what it says in these verses. Rather, Paul says that God's will is something that I am to be filled to capacity with a knowledge of. Okay? Let me tell you, I want to, my first point I want to talk to you about is some popular teaching on the will of God. When I went to Bible college in the late 90s, early 2000s, all anybody wanted to know was, what's God's will for me? Right? And when they were talking like that, what they meant was, you know, mostly what they meant was, what should my career be, who should I marry, and stuff like that is what they were getting at when they were talking about the will of God. Okay? I want to talk to you about two popular ideas about the will of God. Popular idea number one teaches that God has a general and a specific will for every believer. Now, if you want to read more about this, I brought with me this morning an excellent book on this topic, which is called Decision Making and the Will of God. Uh, this was done in the 1980s, 1980, and then revised in like 1994, and it has some very excellent thinking in it that challenges the traditional ways that people have thought about the will of God. Popular idea number one, again, is that there's a general and a specific will. Okay? In the category of the general will, people will say, well, God's general will for you is to be a good Christian, right? to, you know, not lie or steal or chew or hang around with those who do, 
right? That there's this general will, and it's not, it's just to be a good Christian and to sort of, you know, follow what God's word says morally and so forth. And that's the general will. But then there's the specific will. There's the additional aspect of God's will, the specific will that deals with things like, are you going to get married or not? If you're going to get married, who are you going to marry? Where are you going to work? What car are you going to buy? What neighborhood are you going to live in? What career or job are you going to go? And what church does the Lord want me at? Okay? So there's this thinking that, you know, there's this general and then there's the specific will. Okay? The specific will is those, t- those subjects that I just mentioned. Another popular idea is that God has a detailed life plan uniquely designed for every believer, revealed through outward circumstances and inward impressions. Okay? Now, I, I, don't, I have to say it because it, when I was in Bible college, everyone that got married, it was God's will for them to get married. Oh, it's just the will of God. Well, I just know it is. Can I tell you that half the people that we went to Bible college with that claimed that stuff got divorced? Was that God's will too? Okay? So I want you to think about it differently than maybe you thought about it before. And I know that in this room there's probably people of all different levels of understanding about these things, right? The idea, the second idea is that God has a detailed life plan uniquely designed for every believer, revealed through outward circumstances and inward impressions. And the way you discern all this is by following a three-step formula, okay? Step number one, you're supposed to read God's Word and pray. That's just good advice, right? That's just following the Scriptures, and the Scriptures tell you to read the Scriptures, Do the Scriptures tell you to pray without ceasing? So nobody's going to tell you not to read the Bible or not to pray. Step number one. Step number two, though, is read the circumstances or the tea leaves of your life, follow the road signs, and the opening and closing of doors and windows. Right? So they get their, the theology is coming from the sound of music, right? Where the Lord closes a door somewhere, He opens a what? A window, right? You, you remember that scene from The Sound of Music. And so there's the idea that it's my job to be out here looking at what's going on in my life and figuring out where God's trying to what? Point me, direct me, goad me, motivate me based upon the circumstantial evidence that I see around me. Okay? And number three is to listen to God's still, small voice, that inner voice, or your feelings, promptings, hunches, and impressions. Now I'm going to come back to that one later on, because I do believe that God the Holy Spirit is making intercession for a believer according to the will of God, right? But I don't believe that that is occurring in such a way so as to... uh, I'll explain more about that later on, but I just want to put that caveat in there now. And so the result of this three-step process is that the individual believer ends up right in the center of the will of God right where God wants them. If they read the Bible and pray, if they follow the circumstances and they read the road signs and the stuff uh, correctly and they listen to their feelings, hunches, and impressions, then they're going to end up right in the middle of God's will exactly where God wants them to be. Okay, Go to Colossians chapter 1. I think there's a core problem with that. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. Notice what he says. He says, Wherefore I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill what? The Word of God, right? Folks, when the 27 books of the New Testament were done, did God the Holy Spirit put down the pen and did inspiration and revelation cease? Okay, do we now have a complete Word of God given to us by God Almighty, by inspiration, that has revealed and disclosed and made known the mystery of His will? Okay, now if I'm going around though in my life and I'm thinking and I'm operating and I'm functioning with the understanding and the impression that God is going to 
talk to me and show me things circumstantially out here, outside of His Word, okay? Am I fundamentally asking God or telling God that I think I need further revelation from Him than what He's already given me right here? Okay? So it seems to me our, the core problem with the type of thinking that I'm addressing here is that people who function this way are asking God to speak to them apart from His written Word. Okay? God's revelation to mankind ceased with the completion of the New Testament. Okay? To ask God to communicate with you apart from His Word is to expect extra biblical revelation. To expect God to talk to you outside of His what? of his book, right? Now, you don't need to be uh, around too long to know that have all kind of people claimed all kind of revelation from God. Yes, okay? And they all claim to have heard from God. They all claim God spoke to them. They all told them that God told them to do stuff like set up a compound or do whatever the heck they're claiming God told them to do, right? And people follow them in that stuff. My point is, the only way that you know that you have a message from the God of heaven is through an objective standard outside of yourself. Okay, And God has fully made known His will, and He's fully disclosed His will in His Word. And the only way that you know you've received a message from God is through the Word of God, through an objective standard outside of yourself. Right now. Some people are, you know, that, that might be a new concept to them, that might be a new idea, but God has never used circumstances in His Word to be the way that He told people His will. Come with me to Romans 2. Come over to Romans chapter 2. Even when God was dealing with Israel in time past, even dispensationally when God was dealing with the nation of Israel in time past, and He was... And Israel, we know from 1 Corinthians, is the Jews required a what? A sign. Did God operate and function and work through signs with and through the nation of Israel? Yes. Okay. You think about as one example of that, when the children of Israel are, are leaving Egypt, right? There's that scene where they get caught between the Red Sea and the army of what? The armies of Pharaoh, right? And they all murmur, and Moses, what would you do? Bring us out here to die in the wilderness, right? And Moses stretches forth, his, stretches forth his arms and parts what? The Red Sea, right? And then all of Israel goes through on dry ground to the other side, right? And when they get to the other side, and the armies of Egypt follow them into the river, Moses calls all of Israel there, and he says, okay, guys, stand and see the salvation of your God. And what happens? The water clashes down and kills all of that Egyptian army, right? Physical deliverance from a physical enemy in a physical way through a miraculous intervention of God doing it and telling them what it means, right? Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew. She's talking to Israelite here. And restest in the law and makest thy boast of God. Now watch. And knowest His will. Did Israel know the will of God? Yes, they did know the will of God. How did they know it? And knowest His will, and approvest the things that are more excellent. Notice the last phrase. How? Being instructed out of what? How did Israel know what God's will for them was? They had a book that told them what His will for them was, right? They are instructed in the will of God. They know God's will by God's Word to Israel. God communicated His will to them through His written Word to Israel. Come over to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Come over to Deuteronomy chapter 11. So the signed people of God are not left in the dark to wonder and interpret and guess what the signs mean. Did God tell them what they meant in His Word? Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 16. There's a lot of verses we can look at here. I'm just going to uh, take this example. Okay. Now watch what verse 16 says. Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Question, are they supposed to do that? No. What's the first commandment? 
I am the Lord your God, I'm a jealous God, right? You shall know their gods before who? Before me, right? So Moses is addressing this issue here. Look at verse 17. I mean, Deuteronomy 11, verse 16. Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Verse 17. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you. And He shut up the heaven, and there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, unless ye perish quickly off the good land which the Lord giveth you. So does God t- if, if Israel is in a situation where they see no rain and crop failure and famine, are they to scratch their heads and wonder, gee, I wonder what God's telling us? No. Does God's Word tell them what those circumstances mean? Those circumstances mean that they have violated the first what? commandment, and because of their disobedience to the Word of God, to Israel, to them, is there the circumstance that's happening out here is occurring for the particular reason that is stated where? In the Scripture. Come over to 1 Kings chapter 8. We see an example of this. Come over to 1 Kings chapter 8. First Kings chapter eight. <coughs> Look at verse thirty-two. So, in the context here, um, there's some stuff happening related to their disobedience. First Kings chapter eight. Look at verse thirty-two. It says, "Then hear thou in heaven and do and judge thy servants, condemning the wicked." <coughs> to bring his way upon his head, and justify the righteous, to give him according to his righteousness. Now watch verse 33. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall turn again to thee, and confess thy name, and pray, and make supplication unto thee in this house, then hear thou in heaven, and forgive the sin of, the, of thy people Israel, and bring them again into the land which thou givest unto their fathers. When heaven is shut up, and there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee. So when they see no sin and famine and crop failure, why is that happening to them? Because they've sinned against who? Against God. And so, according to the terms of the Mosaic Law, is God judging them for that sin through the circumstantial occurrence of no rain, famine, and crop failure. But they're not like looking around saying, gee, God, what are you trying to tell us? Because He told them what it meant where? In His Word. Now, we can look at a ton of examples of this. Deuteronomy, come with me back to Deuteronomy 13. Come with me back to Deuteronomy chapter 13. An event... Even for Israel, an event could not communicate a message apart from God's written Word. Okay, Apart from an objective standard outside of them. In Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 29, you have the lengthy passages about the blessings and the curses, right? If if Israel will hearken unto the voice of the Lord God, will they be blessed in the field and blessed in the fruit of the land and blessed in all all that they set their hands to? And their enemies will be driven from them and they'll possess the land and all that stuff, right? But what if they don't hearken unto the voice of the Lord their God? Then cursed shall they be in the field and cursed shall be the basket in thy store and their enemies will rule over them, right? And God tells them what all that stuff means in His Word. Deuteronomy 13. Now watch what's going on here. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a what? So this this guy, he's not a faker. He's going to work a legitimate what? Sign or wonder. And giveth thee a sign or a wonder, verse verse 2, and the sign or the wonder come to pass. Whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. So understand what's going on there. If somebody arose in Israel and worked a legitimate sign or wonder, and in conjunction with that sign or wonder told them to go violate the first commandment, what are they supposed to pay attention to? The first commandment or the sign or the wonder? 
They're supposed to pay attention to the first commandment. Look at verse 3. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to what? What's the next word? To know. What is Paul praying for the Colossians over there in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9? That they might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual what? How does Israel know the will of God? Does Israel know the will of God by looking at the circumstance and the sign or the wonder? Or do they know the will of God by looking at the Word of God? Okay? For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you, whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice and ye shall serve Him and cleave unto Him. And the no, notice the prophet. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be what? Whoa. Why is he put to death? Is he put to death for the working of the sign? Or is he put to death for telling them to break the first commandment? So the will of God, even in Israel's program, is revealed for them in the will of God. Now come over to Judges chapter 6. A lot of times people when this topic comes up, they bring up Gideon. Remember Gideon? Okay? I want to look at the example of Gideon. <clears throat> so, the Midianites, in the context, have come and oppressed Israel. Judges chapter 6, verse 1. Notice what it says. And the, children of Eve, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. So let's stop there. Why did God deliver them into the hand of Midian? Because they were just keeping the law and doing what they were supposed to? And doing God's will? Or because they were walking out of step with God's word to Israel? They, they were doing whatever they want, right? Verse 2, And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. They are hiding out in their own land. Okay? And so it was, when Israel had sown, that the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites, and the children of the east, even they came up against them, and they encamped against them, and destroyed the increase of the earth, till thou come unto Gaza, and left no substance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. So, are they being completely and totally afflicted by these Gentile nations? Yes. They sow the seed, and their enemies eat it. Just like it said in Deuteronomy 28 and 29 and Leviticus 26, right? So are they living in the exact set of circumstances that God spelled out and made known in the law would happen if they didn't obey His law, His word? Okay? Now aren't you glad, seriously, let's just stop right there. Aren't you glad you live in the dispensation of grace? Amen. Aren't you glad that you're living, that you're a member of the body of Christ and you're not under the law? Amen. So should that affect the way you understand God's will? Sure, sure seems to me that it should. Okay. Verse 5, And they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So this is the cycle of the book of Judges here, okay? And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage and delivered you <coughs> out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And say, and I say unto you, and I said unto you, I am the Lord your God, fear not the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my what? So why are they in why are they in this set of physical circumstances? 
They're in those circumstances because they didn't obey what? The Word. Verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord that sat under an oak tree, which was an Oprah, um, and pertained unto uh, Joash, the uh, Esbionite, I guess, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So here's Gideon. He's threshing his wheat in secret so that the Midianites won't come and what? Take it. Okay? And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all the miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us, and hath delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am least in my father's house. And So does Gideon have an excuse? What, me? Right? Verse 16, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, Now, and he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a what? What does Gideon want? Is Gideon at that point, at this point right here in the narrative, is Gideon acting in accordance with how he should function as an Israelite? Did the Jews require a what? A sign. He is initially receiving this information. He's initially hearing this from the angel of the Lord that he's going to deliver the Midianites. And Gideon therefore asks for a what? For a sign. Verse, what verse are we in? Verse 17. Verse 17, he said to him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid, and unloving cakes of an ephod of flour. The flesh he put in a basket, and he put... Uh, the broth in a pot, and brought it forth uh, unto him under the oak, and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and unleavened cakes, and lay them upon the rock, and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of a staff that was in his hand, and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and there rose up fire out of the rock, and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes, then the angel of the Lord departed out of his what? Now, has Gideon now received the sign that God intends to work with him exactly as he just stated? Yes. Okay? Come now over to verse... Drop down. Some other stuff happens. Come now to verse 36 for the sake of time. Verse 36, And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast what? Think about that. Has God already spoke to him? Did Gideon request God give him a sign that what he was saying was accurate? He gets the cakes, he gets the unleavened bread, he gets the flesh, he puts it out there on the rock, the angel touches it, fire comes up out of the rock, consumes the cakes. That should have been enough for Gideon as a man of faith in Israel that was God going to do with and through him what he just said he would do. Yeah, but now here's Gideon and he wants what? More proof. Verse 37, Behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. So this is Gideon talking, right? And if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon the earth beside, then, should, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast what? Said. So Gideon is now going to fleece the Lord. He's, ah, I don't know. Did you really mean what you said? Let me test it. And so does God oblige him? 
Yes. Verse, but let, my point is this. When Gideon does this, is Gideon acting by faith in what God said? No. Verse um, 38, And it was so, for he rose up early in the morning and thrust the fleece uh, thrust the fleece together and wringed out the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Now look at verse 39. And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me. I will pray, speak thee, but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry, uh, dry upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be what? Has Gideon already received twice now confirmation of what God intends to do through Gideon? And here he is again. Luckily, God is gracious with Gideon. Verse 40, And God said that, and God did so that night. For it was, a, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew upon the ground. Now, when it comes to the topic of the will of God, there are many believers that think this is the way you should function. Lord, if you want, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to put this thing out here, and if you want me to go take that job, you're going to make this happen. Right? And then so, and, and they, they, cut, they fabricate a situation um, where they're going to somehow, God's going to tell them, apart from His Word, where, they want, where He wants them to go specifically. Right? And my point to you is, don't use Gideon as a model for that, because when Gideon does that, Gideon is not functioning by what? By faith. by faith. Gideon already had a word from God and the appropriate, justifiable, confirmable sign from God that God intended to use Gideon for the purpose that he said he was going to use him for. And when Gideon is asking God over and over again for another sign, Gideon is not acting by what? Faith. Believer, as believers, we need to stop and realize that when it comes to the issue of the will of God, the will of God is not first focused on us. It's focused on who? God. Well, a lot of times what we try to do is we try to justify Brian's will by saying all the stuff that makes it appear in Christianese like we're doing whose will. If you want to do the, here, let me just tell you, the will of God is simple, okay? Amen. If you want to do the will of God, here's what you do. You find out what God's doing, and you go do it. Amen. And if you find out what God's doing, and you go do it, will you be doing the will of God? Okay? So what's God doing? Well, let's look at some things. Go back to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Well, first thing God's doing is we already saw in verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of His what? So, again, is God's will something that He has made known, revealed, and disclosed that I'm responsible to know? Or is it something that i got to go out here and hopefully try to find somehow? He's already did. He's already made known the mystery of His will. Okay? I, didn't, I don't have this one in here, but write it down. 1 Timothy chapter 2, what's the will of God? The will of God is for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of what? The truth. It says it right there in the verse. I'm going to go read it for you in case you don't believe me. Okay? Don't take my word for it. Be a Berean and check it out. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Who will have all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? So, when it comes to the issue of the will of God, has God already made known the mystery of His will? Is the will of God for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? Go back to Ephesians. Go back to Ephesians. Go to chapter 2. Looking at some things in Ephesians. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Start at verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For He is our peace, who hath made both one, hath broken down the middle wall partition between us. That's between Jew and Gentile. <coughs> having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God 
in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. What is God doing today? What God is doing today is He is forming the body of Christ. He is forming the one new man, the church, the body of Christ. Israel is in temporary blindness so that God could unfold the mystery of His what? Of His will as it pertained to the body of Christ. And He's made it known, revealed it, and disclosed it in His Word. What's God doing today? He wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And He's forming the one new man, the church, the body of Christ. What else is He doing? Go to Ephesians 3. Go to Ephesians 3. There's some, let me say it this way, what we're looking at in these next few, these are some macro things. He's revealed the mystery of His will. He's forming the body of Christ. He wants all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Those are macro, big picture things that God's doing. But you know that He also has some micro, individual things for us to do. And they're all part of knowing and being filled with the knowledge of His will. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. <laughs> and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. What does God want today? What is His will today? His will is for all men to see the fellowship of the mystery. Now, would that question help you answer where you should go to church? Seems to me that it would. If you're looking at where would God have me to go to church, He would have you to go to church at an assembly that has at its core mission to have all men see the fellowship of what? The mystery. Why? Because that's what God is doing today. Look at chapter 4 of Ephesians. <laughs> see, if, if Christians... God doesn't care about the music the style, whether there's padded seats or pews or all the dumb stuff that everybody gets all bent out of shape about today. What God cares about is, is that book being preached? And is that book being preached rightly divided? And is that assembly standing for the revelation of God, for the wisdom of God and the mystery? And are they about holding forth the word of life so that all men can be saved and come to the knowledge of what? The truth. and the, yeah, That's part of it. Coming to the knowledge of the truth, part of it, is understanding the fellowship of what? The mystery. But then we have individual stuff. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 22. That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new what? What's God's will for you? Is God's will for you to walk around like in your old stinking thinking of your flesh? Or is His will for you to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to practically put on the new man who He's made you to be in Christ? Okay? That's part of the will of God. So not only is the will of God the macro, dispensational stuff, the big picture stuff that I gave you in the first three examples, the will of God is very pertinent as it's revealed here to you and me. I don't have to... Look it, I'm going to tell you one thing right now, okay? That, those two verses right there and the rest of this, look at the rest of this. Put away lying. How are you doing with that? Don't answer. Put away lying, speak the truth to every man his neighbor, be angry and sin not. How are you doing with that? Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. Okay? Rather let him work it. Uh, look at verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Woohoo! How are you doing with that? See, all of that is God's what? Do you understand that there's enough in that, those four or five verses right there to occupy your time from now till the rapture? Amen. Without having to worry about, oh, well, what should I do over here? Let God's, word in, let God's Word teach you how to think to instruct you what you should what? Do over there. Have some wisdom and some spiritual what? Understanding. So you got no corrupt communication. How about, oh, how about uh, verse 32? And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You know, that's God's will too. How's that going? See, now it's quiet. We can get all excited about the macro stuff, but the micro stuff is just as real and it's just as much a part of God's will as all the dispensational stuff. 
But you understand that this stuff he's talking about here, then you get into the next chapter, and he talks about in verse 4, filthiness and fornication. He talks about fornication in verse 3, uncleanness, covetousness. He talks about filthiness and foolish talk and jesting. He talks about all this stuff, right? Unless, you know, you're 100% sanctified in the practicality of your life, is there enough stuff to occupy your attention here till eternity? Go to chapter 5. God's will is in His Word. His Word, right, his word rightly divided will tell you what is Word. Verse, verse 15, Ephesians 5, 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools. What is what? Look at how are you going to walk wise? You're going to walk wise because you are filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual what? Understanding. Having that understanding gives you the capacity so you don't have to walk as a fool. But you can walk how? Wise. See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. So you mean in my life I'm supposed to be redeeming the time? Is that God's will? Yeah. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise. Now watch the next phrase. But understanding what the will of the Lord is. Not go find it. Not stumble upon it. Not find it under a rock or in a tree somewhere. But understand what it is. How do you understand what it is? Right here. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 3. <coughs> 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from what? Fornication. Every, for every one of you should know. There it is again. Should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the other Gentiles, which know not who. Do you, so understand. How you conduct yourself sexually in your life, is that part of the will of God? If you're conducting in premarital sex, if you're committing adultery, if you're off looking at stuff on the internet and pornography and, and all that stuff, and into all those addictions and so on and so forth, you're not possessing your body, you're not possessing your vessel in sanctification and what? That is a practical issue related to the will of God, and that's part of God's will. Okay? So it's amazing, right? You go to Bible college and everyone's all having premarital sex and they're all waiting for God to show them their will. Just being real, okay? So we can move on. <laughs> go, to first, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 16. Is it God's will for you to rejoice evermore? Is it God's will for you to pray without ceasing? Is it God's will for you in everything to give thanks? For this is what? The will of God in Christ Jesus. I'm telling you right now, it doesn't say for everything give thanks. It says in everything what? Give thanks. Can I tell you that that right there will occupy you to the rapture? Being grateful in everything, that's, that does not come easy, does it? But is that God's will? It says, for this is, it says right in the verse, read it in black and white, it says, for this was the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning who? Is it God's will that you quench the Spirit in verse 19? No. Is it, despise not prophecy, prophecy, uh, prophesying, verse 21, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and, and the very God of peace sanctify you how? Holy. Okay? Again, is all of that, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, etc., is all that the will of God? What about Romans 12, 2? What about Romans 12, 1 and 2? Go to Romans chapter 12. Is this the will of God? There's no area of your life that God hasn't told you what His will is. 
He's told you His will for your thought life. He's told you, he's told you His will for your, um, for, for, for your sexual life. He's told you His will for your spiritual life. He's told you His will for your uh, vocational life. If a, man, if a man doesn't work, neither should he what? Eat, right? He told you that. Everywhere you want to turn, does God's Word say something to you, about you, for you, as a believer, about what our, God's will for us is? Amen. Okay? Well, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's God's will. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Be ye transformed by the renewing of what? Is it God's will that you be conformed to the world? No. Is it God's will that you be transformed by the renewing of your mind? Yes. So when Paul is talking about, in Colossians 1.9, being filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, he is talking about the big stuff, the dispensational stuff, but he's also talking about the small personal stuff. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 39. 1 <coughs> Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. The wife, is bound by the, by, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to marry, to be married to whom she, what? Will. Whose choice is it? Hers. Does she have to walk around trying to find the divine providential appointment of God on her life or who she's going to marry? It's not what the verse says, but it does say, whom she will only in the Lord. It is God's will that a believer marry another what? Believer. believer. That's the will of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Stop at chapter 5 on your way to chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to who? Is it God's will for your life to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ? Yes. Come to chapter ten. Chapter 10, verse 3, For we walk in the flesh, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of who? Is it God's will for your life to have control and dominion and so forth over your thought life? And bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Is that God's will for you? Again, how, you know, I feel like that's plenty to occupy me without me having to go try to find anything else to do. Galatians 5, last, almost last, maybe. Galatians 5. Verse 13. <coughs> for brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love do what? Is it God's will for you to use your liberty under grace to serve other people? For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. God's will is for us to use the liberty of we've been given under grace, not to serve ourselves, not to sow to our flesh, but to serve other people. And God's will is for us to be involved in one anothering. So, in conclusion, i got a couple things. I want you to get two passages. In one hand, I want you to get Romans 8. And in the other hand, get Colossians 1. Romans 8. In Colossians 1.
Is God's Word complete? Yes. yes. If God's Word is complete, then that must mean that inspiration and revelation have ceased. Because God has said everything that we need for faith and practice where? In His Word. Even in Israel's program, in time past, dispensationally, God did not use circumstances to reveal His will to them. His will was revealed in His Word, and His Word told them what the circumstances what meant. Romans 8, verse 26. <coughs> Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth, interesting, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of what? Folks, I'm going to read this to you in my notes. God the Holy Spirit's advocacy and intercession on our behalf is in line with the will of God. Okay? The job of the Holy Spirit in your life is not to reveal new things to you. Not to tell you things outside of God's Word. Not to add addendums and appendices and additions to the Scripture. The job of the Holy Spirit in your life is not to do that. Rather, His job in your life is to advocate for the truth of God's revealed will in your life. Does the Holy Spirit want you to take every thought captive? Does the Holy Spirit want you to renew your mind? Does the Holy Spirit want you to forgive and want you to serve others and want you to do all of those things, right? And so His intercession in you that He makes with groanings which cannot be uttered is not about telling you, hey, you really should move over there or you really should do that. You're free to make all those choices for who? Yourself, right? His role in your life is to advocate for the truth of the revealed will of God that God has made known the macro stuff and the micro stuff, the dispensational stuff and the personal what? And there is plenty in all of that to occupy you from now till eternity. And if we would just find out what God's doing and do that, what would we be doing? We'd be doing the will of God. Through the cross, we have, Romans 5, 1, we've been given peace with God, and we've been given an absolute standing in grace. Okay? There, now, understand, therefore we are free, we have liberty, we read the verse, right? We are free and we are competent, based upon an understanding of the current dispensation of grace, and with a renewed mind to make decisions for ourselves. Okay? Does God need His ambassadors in every community, on every job site, and in every place of occupation? Does God care if you're a mailman, a ditch digger, a teacher, a plumber, working? In other words, are you able to do the will of God as a member of the body of Christ wherever you are? Yes. Come to Colossians 1 and I'll close. Now I want you to take all of everything I just said about the will of God. About the dispensational stuff and the personal stuff which in my mind are linked, okay? Is it God's will for me to be running around thinking I'm spiritual Israel? Is it God's will for me to be extracting things willy-nilly out of the Old Testament that I like and trying to make them apply to me today? No, it's not God's will. Is it God's will for me to function as an adult member of the church, the body of Christ? So look at verse 9. For this cause, 
We also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual what? So I'm saying to you that when I read that statement there at the end of the verse 9 about being filled with the knowledge of His will, I have in my mind and in my understanding all the verses we just went through. The verses from Ephesians, the verses from Paul's epistles, all those verses about the dispensational stuff and the personal stuff, I have in mind all of that. I have in mind the totality of all that thing and the stuff that I didn't include and left out, which I can think of at least two things that I should have put in the list, but I didn't for the sake of time, right? So to be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now watch. Why does it matter? Who cares? Verse 10. That you might walk out worthy of the Lord unto all what? Pleasing. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of who? Do you understand that you can't, you can't do verse 10 if you don't know what's going on in verse 9? The worthy walk, the pleasing unto the Lord, the fruitful in every good work is going to be the result It's going to be the natural outcome and and outflow, if you will, of the being filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And if my thinking about God's will is that it's something out here that I still have to go find until I've found it, how do I have any ability to walk what? Worthy. God's will is not that. God's will is revealed here, even the mystery of His will. And as I gain knowledge, as I gain wisdom and spiritual understanding, I'm able to make biblically intelligized decisions in my life. And the outflow of that is going to be a worthy what? See, people want to put the cart before the horse. Okay? Look, I hope that makes sense to you. If this teaching on God's will is new for you, it has not been my intention this morning to offend anyone. But I will say, if you hadn't, can't tell, I am very passionate about what I just said. Okay? Because there is way too much confusion. And way too many people who are living in the tyranny and under the tyranny of bad thinking about these issues while they're waiting for, something, for God to just like to send this additional piece of information to them on high, or even worse, put it into someone else's mind. The Holy Spirit works today in us. I believe the Holy Spirit is working. He's working in me. He's working in you. And when we get together as a body, He works in all of us. Okay, But He's not working contrary to truth. And your life, your Christian life, was never designed to be lived on the basis of ignorance. You need to be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And the will of God is in the Word of God, rightly divided. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time. We're grateful for these folks that have sat here patiently and listened to this message. We do pray that if there's questions about this or some um, uneasiness or just new thinking here that uh, folks would ask and we, there could be a discussion. We're grateful for all that you've done for us through Christ. And I just want to say this. I am so grateful that I am not under the law. I'm so thankful that when I mess up, that when I do things I shouldn't, when I think things I shouldn't, when I say things I shouldn't, that you don't just come down with the hammer and smack me and smite me and do the kinds of things that we read about happening in the Old Testament. Not because you're an angry God, not because you're a mean God, but because Israel said all that the Lord has said we will do. They agreed to it. They signed on the dotted line. They said they could do it and that they would keep it. But they couldn't. And now here we are on this side of the cross on the basis of the revelation committed to the Apostle Paul we're able to sit here and understand that we're not under the law, but we're under grace. That we're not spiritual Israel. That we're the body of Christ. We're grateful that when we can know that if we will just find out what you're doing and do that, we'll be doing your will. We ask this in Christ's name.